A very good evening and welcome to Primetime News on TV1. We've got the latest news lined up for you from here at home and across the globe. I'm Charlene Benedict. A very good evening. I am Rahna Farooq. Let's start off with a look at your headlines for tonight. Hailstorm in Kilinochi. Over 200 houses damaged in Ampara due to gusty winds. Hospitals come to a standstill due to GMOA token strike. Central Bank refuses to reveal details of 10 billion rupees state bank deal. Will the joint opposition receive the position of leader of the opposition? The Department of Meteorology forecasts winds of 40 to 50 kilometers per hour, which could be expected across the districts of Hambantota and Matale in the next few hours. 217 houses in the Ampara district were damaged due to gale winds that blew across several areas in Ampara yesterday. Strong winds blew across several areas in Ampara during a heavy rainfall from 4 to 5 p.m. yesterday. Area residents said gale winds blew across for close to 10 minutes during the rainfall. Our roof was blown away along with the sudden winds. Ampara District Secretary Tusira P. Vanigasingha said the villages of Navagampura, Saddhatissapura, Mehindupura, Jayawadanapura and Harangava were affected from the winds adding that three houses were destroyed. The areas of Vattuagal and Selvapuram in Mulaitu experienced a hailstorm during rainfall yesterday evening. Our correspondent said the hailstorm was reported during 3 to 4 p.m. yesterday. The Government Medical Officers Association launched a one-day token strike today. Hospitals came to a standstill due to the issue and a group of doctors from the private sector also joined the trade union action. The GMOA launched the strike at 8 this morning, demanding solutions for 10 issues, including the Singapore-Sri Lanka Free Trade Agreement and implementing their proposals. The association points out the Sri Lanka-Singapore FTA not only affects the medical sector, but also has a negative impact over the whole country, and that the relevant authorities have not given a positive response, although they were informed of the adverse impacts. Emergency medical services were carried out in children's wards, cancer hospitals and women's hospitals were underway as usual. We heard there was a strike and were wondering what to do. It is frustrating to travel up and down by bus. We were here by 7 and the OPD was closed. There's no medicine. They will launch strikes because they have money. They travel by cars and they don't have a problem. Patients strongly oppose the doctors of the Chilau Hospital. Look at how time has been wasted by the poor people. We leave homes in the morning and come here carrying reports, expecting to get back home soon. They sit in parliament and fight. What has been done for us? The ministers fly to Singapore to get medicine. We don't even have money to travel back to Colombo. The poor is constantly being burdened. We are helpless. We have to come here to get medicine. A doctor is considered as God in the society. They shouldn't worship palaces instead of serving people. We came at four this morning. Both the legs are broken. We are left hopeless. The poor is always burdened. They impose taxes and burden us more. A group of doctors from the Badulla Hospital handed over a letter to Minister Harin Fernando's office, mentioning their demands and opposing a statement made by the minister about the doctors of the state sector. The group of doctors who lined up one kilometre away from the office passed the letter from one hand to the other to hand it over to the minister's office. We have presented proposals based on the Singapore-Sri Lanka Free Trade Agreement. They have planted this in Sri Lanka according to what the International Monetary Fund wants. The ministers and MPs who go to nightclub should forget that for a while and think about the consequences of this agreement and the impact it has on the country. 
We have clearly mentioned that the document presented before the cabinet is a fraudulent national policy. Even if the strike ends tomorrow, when this continues, they will not be able to stop these strike actions from taking place. Meanwhile, issuing a communique, Minister of Health Dr. Rajasena Ratna says the strike action was launched to mislead the general public. The minister added that 24% hike in income tax is only applied to those who earn more than 350,000 rupees per month. The communique notes the percentage for those who earn less than 350,000 rupees will remain at 12%. The minister in the communique that the VAT imposed on private hospitals has been completely removed. The officer of the speaker states a final decision has not been reached with regard to the increase of salaries for the MPs and ministers. The speaker's office in a statement says as per a parliamentary proposal passed on the 23rd of November 2006, it had been decided to increase the salaries of MPs and ministers in accordance to the increase also given to judges of higher courts. The requests that have been made citing that the MPs and ministers' salaries should be increased parallel to the salary increase granted to the judicial sector recently have been directed to the Parliamentary General Secretary by the Speaker for observations to be made. The Speaker's office says a decision on whether the matter should be looked at as per the decision taken in 2006 or according to a separate system would be reached at the Parliamentary Party Leaders' meeting. The proposal for the increase in the salaries had been put forward by a party leader by the name of Gunavardhani in the joint opposition who claims to be patriot. In 2003, UPFA former minister J. Raj Pule put forward a proposal stating if the salaries of the judges are increased, there needs to be a parallel increase on the salaries of MPs as well. This increase is something similar and will be in accordance to the salary increase given to the judges in January. Though the matter is in the constitution, they must think about the country and the sufferings of the people and oppose this. One hundred thousand rupees has been added as an office allowance. Another one thousand rupees has been added for a separate allowance. The minimum fuel allowance for a person in Colombo is thirty thousand nine hundred and forty nine rupees. There is a telephone allowance of fifty thousand rupees. There is another ten thousand rupee as a private office allowance and two thousand five hundred per day for attendance. If one attends parliament for eight days of the month, he would receive twenty thousand rupees. If you collect them all, it's 266,234 rupees. This is the minimum salary of an MP. This could be cut in half by leaving aside all those allowances. We request that all these allowances be removed and a legal salary scale be imposed. There was a large salary increase in the public servants. However, there was no increase for the MPs. There is no issue on that. We are not saying that there needs to be an increase for them. I believe the public sector ought to think more of the country and not engage in their struggles for salary increases. If this is realized, the country will be able to move forward. We request the government to double the 2,500 rupee Samurdi allowance given to the beneficiaries rather than increasing the salaries of the MPs. If there is a proposal to increase the salaries of MPs before increasing the salaries of all other sectors, the proposal is a joke. The joint opposition and the Podujana front opposes this move. There is a party leaders meeting and MP Dinesh Kunavardhana is among them. There are members from the joint opposition in this. They must have requested for the increase since there was an increase for salaries of the judges. Then they go out and say to the media, this is their conduct. They make a proposal and then comment to the media. The Speaker of Parliament has not approved this at all. Well, you just heard the views and comments expressed by both government and opposition uh, politicians commenting on the proposal to increase the salaries of MPs and ministers, our public representatives. Now, if you take a look at this image right here, now. Uh, Public representative or MP gets a basic salary of 54,285 rupees. They also get an allowance office which was recently introduced of 100,000 rupees. These public representatives also get a telephone allowance which is 50,000 rupees. The stamp duty for all their other purposes comes from 100 rupees. Now they are also given a vehicle. Now, 
annual allowance, which is 41,890 rupees. Let's now come to the most important item in every minister, which is the vehicle they travel in. Now, recently on all our news channels, we add footage like this of these luxury vehicles that are moving in and out of places used by the public representatives. Now, this particular footage was aired on our sister channel, CSA TV, and the most of these vehicles are expensive vehicles. And one of those vehicles is something called a V8, which is used by most of the parliamentarians. Now, this V8 is priced around 40 million rupees at that time. Now, if you take a look at the market rates right now, this V8 SUV is priced around 36 million rupees. So 36 million rupees is used by a public representative for a period of five years that they are serving in the House of Legislature. Now, if you divide it by each year for 60 months, that figure would come up to 600,000 rupees a month. Now, these public representatives are also given something called a vehicle permit. Now, this vehicle permit can be sold from between 25 million rupees to 35 million rupees. And this is not a small amount, 25 million to 35 million rupees, which is given every five years. Now, if you add this entire total together, you, mu you might understand what kind of a figure we are talking about, and you might understand how difficult it is for our public representatives also to survive. Now, let's shift gears from the public representatives who get such an amount to the common people in the country, especially in the public sector. Now, this right here on the screen is a pay sheet of a, a peer attached to the Ministry of Education who gets a basic salary of 19,440 rupees and he takes a gross pay of 32,178 rupees. Then it's also moved to another pay slip also from the Minister of, Ministry of Education, rather, a development officer. Now this development officer is getting a basic salary of 25,686 rupees with a gross pay of 36,574. Let's move on to the pay of a teacher. The teacher who is educating the children, the future generations of this country, who will be taking over the future of this country. The basic salary of this particular teacher from the Columbus Zonal Education Office is 39,319 rupees with a gross pay of 50,866 rupees. Now this is a grade three teacher. The the main issue that the people have is how are they going to survive with such an amount of money. Now, if you take a look at the amounts that we highlighted earlier over here, you can see that these massive allowances are being collected by the public representatives at a time the people of this country are facing numerous difficulties in order to survive on a daily basis. In addition to this, they also get a fully paid vehicle from the government, that is your public funds, your money, your taxpaying money. Now, some might even bring about an argument that these MPs are attempting to get their salary increase because they want to bring a bigger, bigger pension for them when they retire uh, after their term is over in parliament. Now, some might even say that they're attempting to bring out this salary increase because they're not sure that the people would bring them back into power for whatever service that they have already done for the people. Now, we just did a comparison between the public representatives and the employees in the public sector. Now, we are not trying to compare uh, the teacher and the public representative because a public representative is not even close to the capabilities carried out and the duties performed by a teacher. But every single one of us have a dream of having a good meal and eventually leading a wonderful and better life in this country. As I mentioned earlier, the most favored vehicle among these public representatives is worth 36 million rupees. 
600,000 per year if you calculate it up to five years. They also get a fuel allowance of 41,890 rupees. Don't forget, also they get that fully paid government vehicle. Now, what about the managerial levels in the private sector, the top executives in the private sector? Now, they also get a fuel allowance of around 75,000 to 125,000 rupees. But do the math, see the comparison, and then you will understand uh, who is doing a greater service to this nation. Is it the public representative getting 600,000 a month for that vehicle, or is it the top tier executive who is just taking home uh, allowance just above 75,000 rupees? And if you do the calculations, the public representatives get almost 650,000 rupees just with that 600,000 and the fuel allowance just because they own a vehicle. Now, the people in the private sector who showcase their wonderful lives are not entitled to these benefits that we see on screen right here. They had to work hard for what they get. Is this not a very sad situation in the country? When you compare the service done by these so-called public representatives, and when you compare the service done by the hundreds and thousands of hard-working people employed all across the private sector do not come across a very sad situation. You will be able to identify the difference when you do the math yourself. We report and you decide. Let's now cross over for a short commercial break. Welcome back. You're watching Primetime News on TV1. President Maithripala Sirisena attended several events held in Anuradhapura and Pulunarva this morning. The head of state attended the annual prize giving of the Swarnapali Balika Vidyale in Anuradhapura. Attending the event, President Maithripala Sirisena promised to provide them with a two-story building, one of the main requirements at the school, and to build a flyover from the school to the ground based on a special request made by the school. Thereafter, President Maitri Palasirisena declared open the Deepani Mahavidyalaya, which was renamed as President's College. A newly constructed two-storied building based on the Lagava Pasala, Hudama Pasala, or nearest school, the best school, was vested in the students today. <laughs> Meanwhile, a two-story Dhanashala and the student center constructed at the Bhikkhu University in Andhradhapura was also declared open by the president today. Several MPs and ministers were also present at this event. Several other projects launched under the Pibide Mupolo Narva program were also vested in the public today. A three-story classroom building and the teacher's quarters constructed at the Habarana Secondary School was also opened under the auspices of the president. <laughs> Convening a media briefing in Colombo today, Professor Colvin Gunaratna explained the reasons for his resignation from the Sri Lanka Medical Council. According to the current constitution, the Sri Lanka Medical Council cannot take any decision independently. Therefore, it is hard to clearly say what are the main acts that can be initiated through this. That is the main reason to resign. The main target of the Sri Lanka Medical Council is to ensure the safety of our people. This is not happening through this. That is due to certain shortcomings in the act. It is not a personal problem, a political problem, and no, a problem due to the minister. This is a legal problem. There is an administrative issue in this. It cannot be administered. We cannot achieve our target as long as this act is there. A union came into being so as to secure their team. However, 16 out of the 25 are there to secure the doctors. How can they safeguard the rights of the patients while only focusing on safeguarding the rights of the doctors? My complaint is that through this council, justice is not delivered to the people. This act is not suitable for 2018. If the shortcomings in this act can be corrected and a new act can be introduced, I would agree 100% to that. The central bank governor was grilled by journalists today over the 10 billion rupee loan granted to a company in which Jehan Amrathunga is listed as a director while serving as a director of People's Bank. Jehan Amrathunga, the director of uh, People's Bank, uh, has obtained a loan of uh, 10 billion rupees uh, for a company to which he serves as the executive vice president. Uh, this is uh, MTD Walkers. 
uh, has this uh, loan uh, followed the standard procedure of obtaining a loan and uh, can a director of uh, a state institution obtain such a massive loan like that and also what is the security given by MTD Walkers for this loan? Okay. Okay. We'll answer. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Fernando, the assistant governor will answer. I'm yes. sorry, we are not in a position to respond on a specific transaction, but I'll let you know the general situation that happens when it comes to transactions of directors. Directors are not prohibited from taking loans from their own bank that they are director, but we have a set of prudential regulations that monitor that. So based on that, in their taking a loan, the board of directors have to approve it on a two-third majority, excluding the particular director. And also Central Bank has specified what kind of securities they should take if they are giving a loan to a director. That is not the case with regard to the normal loans. So provided these requirements are met, it is normal for them to take loans and do their businesses. When we go on examination, we go in very detail to these what we call related party transactions. Our officers are looking at those. If there are issues, we always bring them and they take regulatory action, require them to correct those violations. So this can be one of such transactions which we have into. And also if there has been have taken action. If there is no violation, we cannot take some because we have allowed that th th that kind of transactions are permitted to be done within the prudential frame. So you are saying that this uh, specific transaction has gone through the standard procedure and has been approved? As I started, I cannot comment based on the secrecy provisions on a single specific transaction. Okay, so cannot comment on the securities given by the company as well? Uh, sorry, I cannot. Governor of the Central Bank, the people of the country understand that it is the Central Bank of Sri Lanka that has the right to regulate the system of licensed commercial banks in the country. Why are you avoiding the questions posed on behalf of the people of the country regarding the People's Bank, which is a state-owned bank where public funds circulate in large volumes? While you hand over the responsibility to respond to these questions to an assistant director who will be held responsible for the 10 billion rupees in public funds to the assistant director Fernando. What we have to say is, can you move away from the responsibility over such a massive amount of public funds by giving such a simple answer? When one takes a look at the guidelines, circulars and regulations imposed by the central bank on licensed commercial banks, one would be able to understand that it is not easy for a director of a bank to secure a loan from the very bank he is holding that position as director. The People's Bank, in its clarification to News First, says the loan was approved as all requirements demanded by them had been met. If what they say is true, should this not be reviewed? Another matter was the Board of Directors of Licensed Commercial Banks must meet at least once a month and copy their minutes to the Central Bank. The Assistant Director has a very simple task of looking at those minutes. By doing so, one would be able to find out if at least two-thirds of the Board of Directors had approved this loan. What is the security provided by MTD Walkers when securing such a massive loan? Was this even considered? Why is it that the officials at the central bank who have the power to supervise the functions of the licensed commercial banks are citing various reasons and are avoiding the questions posted on behalf of the public? We will keep a very close watch on this transaction on behalf of the general public. Now, as mentioned on our headlines, the area of Vaduagala and Selvapuram in Mulathivu experienced a hailstorm yesterday. A correspondent said, who sent these photographs and images said uh, that the hailstorm was reported during 3 and 4 p.m. yesterday. State Minister... Welcome back to the news. In local news still, State Minister of Power and Renewable Energy, Ajit P. Pereira, convened a media briefing in Bandaragama today. Kota-based group of the joint opposition boycotted it. The group against Mahindra Rajapaksha boycotted it. But finally, only around 3,000 came forward to represent the people of this country. 
there is a division within the joint opposition. Vimal, Gammanpilla and Vasu provided evidence for the implosion that everyone is talking about. Gammanpilla, Vasu, Speaker Karu Jaya Surya inquired from the General Secretary of UPFA, Minister Mahinda Amravira, about the stance of the UPFA regarding the request made by the joint opposition to appoint an opposition leader from their fraction. The joint opposition handed over a letter to the Speaker with names of 70 MPs and 8 signatures on the 30th of July. The Speaker has sent me a letter requesting us to present the stance of the UPFA regarding the opposition leader position. We cannot hold the position of opposition leader while working together with the government. The current opposition will do the needful and we will provide answers in the future. We request the General Secretary of the UPFA to leave the letter about the opposition leader aside and compose a letter to the Speaker mentioning the alliance will leave the government. Then the General Secretary of the UNP will have to speak about the opposition leader position. Then we will have to speak about the cabinet after the appointment of Mahindu Rajapaksa as the Prime Minister of the country. Vice Minister of the Communist Party of China, Guo Yezhao, who is on an official visit to Sri Lanka, visited the Pathfinder Foundation today. He was welcomed by the founder of the Pathfinder Foundation, Milinda Morogoda, and senior members of the foundation. During the hour-long meeting, both sides discussed how best to strengthen and further develop relations between the two countries, as well as institutions in both countries that are working to promote better understanding and cooperation. Now, in news from the Sri Lankan entertainment industry, Dharmayu there produced by M Entertainment of the Capital Maharaja Organization Limited, won two awards at the 34th Sarasavi Film Awards a short while ago. Dharmayu there won the award for the most popular film, and Thisuru Yuvenika, who portrayed the character of Achini, won the accolade for Best Upcoming Actress. Dharmayu there is also the movie that recorded the highest income for the year 2017. The movie was also awarded the award for the best song for the Amage Male by Ajit Kumar. And Ajit Kumar Siri was given the award for best lyrics in the song for the movie Motor Bicycle and also bagged the awards for best music direction. Best screenplay, Best Actor 2016 was awarded to Dasun Pathirana. Motor Bicycle was adjudged the best film 2016. 34th Sarasavi Film Awards is currently underway at the Bandaraika Memorial International Conference Hall. Today is day two of the second four-day test match between the Sri Lanka and South Africa emerging teams. The Sri Lankan emerging team was bowled out for 319 runs in their first innings. The match is being played at the Hammadur International Stadium in Suri River. At the start of play, the Sri Lanka emerging team was 69 runs from the loss of three wickets. Sham Washan scored 61 runs. Charida Asalanka scored a century for Sri Lanka emerging. In response, the South Africa emerging team managed to score 216 runs all out. Let's now take a look at today's illustrated news by cartoonist Asanka Ladoheti. And that's a wrap of Prime Time News for tonight. To follow details of these stories and more, you can log on to our award-winning website, www.newsfirst.ok. I'm Charlotte Benedict. For the News First team, I am Rahna Farooq. Thank you for watching. Have a pleasant night.